The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello, uh, I'm Eli Levine. I'm with the United States Department of Energy's Better Buildings Initiative. Uh, I'd like to welcome you to the February edition of the Better Buildings webinar series. Uh, in this series, we profile the best practices of Better Plants, Better Buildings Challenge, uh, of the Better Plants, Better Buildings Challenge and Alliance partners and other organizations uh, working to improve energy efficiency uh, in buildings and plants uh, all across the country. Uh, next slide, please. So we're really excited to have you today. We have a really excited, uh, really great group of panelists here. Uh, we're going to do something a little different here. Rather than uh, typically, we uh, these programs offer uh, phenomenal technical assistance and tips and strategies to improve the energy efficiency of your building. And uh, we really want uh, through the Better Buildings, Better Plants program to feel to make all of our partners and allies feel like when you're partnering through uh, this program that you have access to all of the great things that the Department of Energy uh, has to offer. So this panel will give us an opportunity to talk about some of those other things and to talk about um, you know, some of the real world applications that inform R&D. So we're, we're gonna talk about some innovation and some ways to access uh, DOE National Labs and some of the public-private uh, consortia activities that we have going on. Uh, because these are all very exciting and we're seeing uh, breakthrough technologies uh, every day. Uh, our secretary calls our national labs the, uh, the crown jewels for research and innovation uh, in the country. And uh, we have some great programs to, uh, uh, to really help, uh, to help you access these, uh, these resources. So uh, slide three, please. Thank you. Uh, I guess before we get started with our presentations, I want to remind our audience that we'll have well, we'll hold questions until near the end of the hour. Uh, please send in your questions through, through the chat box on your webinar screen, on my screen that's to the right. Um, and uh, uh, throughout the session, so send them in as your questions come up and we'll try to get to as many of them as we can. Uh, the session will be archived and post, uh, posted to the web uh, for your reference as well, should you miss anything as you're taking notes. So uh, to start us off, uh, let's, uh, Let's hear from Clara Asmail from uh, the Department of Energy. I'm thrilled to have Clara uh, with me here. She's a uh, close colleague at the department. She's the Deputy Director for Policy and Practice in the Office of Technology Transitions at the Department of Energy, where she leads coordination among DOE programs and labs to develop uh, policies and practices that optimize commercialization and the impacts of DOE capabilities, facilities, and technologies. Uh, previously, Cl Clara led uh, the, te the Technology Acceleration Program at the NIST Manufacturing Extension Partnership within the Department of uh, Commerce by building mechanisms to support MEP centers on uh, technology-based engagements with uh, 30,000 manufacturers annually. Uh, prior to 2010, she directed the NIST uh, SBIR uh, program and at the NIST uh, Technology Partnerships Office, she conducted commercial assessments on invention disclosures and negotiated uh, cooperative agreements, uh, CRADAs and licenses. Uh, the first dozen years of her career were as a principal investigator on angular, uh, angularly resolved light scanner uh, from surfaces. Uh, she published 20 plus papers and co-invented a method to resolve light scattered uh, from particulate uh, micro roughness subsurface uh, defect sources. That patent license earned uh, the historical hi uh, highest royalty revenue to NIST. Uh, so with that, I'll uh, I'll turn this over to Clara. Clara, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you, Lee. Uh, Eli, this is great. I'm really glad to be with you and uh, join you and your 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 group there at the Better Buildings. You mentioned that um, you want to be able to ensure that your participants feel like they are part of this greater. Uh, Department of Energy family where we have these crown jewels at the labs and the tremendous capabilities and I want to give you just a, a quick taste and some guidance on how you might um, access some of that. Can you please flip the slide for me? Thank you. Okay, that, that's where we start. May I have the next please? Um, the, the Department of Energy has 17 national laboratories in addition to a few other production facilities, but these are where the bulk of our R&D is conducted and it's mainly across the whole country. Many of these facilities you've heard of and um, 
they push out tremendous research results, uh, discoveries, um, inventions uh, every single year. 20,000 scientists, um, we dominate in the R&D 100 awards, so many um, Nobel laureates. It, it's a real powerhouse, something that every American should be very proud of. Next slide, please. From these 17 labs, um, I, I certainly would never be able to uh, even briefly summarize everything. This is just a, a very tiny sampling of the kinds of technologies that have come out from the labs. Over on the right-hand side, the modeling simulation um, that was developed in order to support nuclear weapon uh, production and dismantling um, at Lawrence, I'm sorry, at Los Alamos, um, was transferred through a 25-year collaboration between Los Alamos and Procter and Gamble, um, so that they can understand how to keep a baby's bottom dry He's in diapers. Um, on the left-hand side, you see a large area of additively manufactured. Uh, house and other products on the bottom left, the, the, the vibrant colors that come from quantum dots um, for displays that you have in your everyday um, computer products. May I have the next slide, please? And while you're flipping that middle one at the bottom, that was Lawrence Livermore's technology that shows up in your cars and other vehicles when you're getting too close to another object and it either beeps or automatically stops. Um, that detection um, comes from Lawrence Livermore. In the middle there, the NETL algorithm to be able to display um, uh, the error uncertainty in data is something that was very useful, a way to demonstrate something so simple. Once you see it, it's very elegant. But before NETL's uh, invention, it was always very difficult to quantify on 2D the error associated with um, each of these pixels. Uh, and then on the bottom right, I'm not going to go through all of these, but the bottom right is Ames. Um, very famous lead-free solder that transformed the electronics industry. Next slide, please. And then, of course, our uh, bread and butter from the beginning where we have uh, radioactivity um, that is emerging out of from the nuclear uh, weapons uh, research into diagnostics and uh, therapy as well as imaging for medical science. Now the next slide, please. So given that we have such a breadth of um, capabilities, facilities, and expertise across the, uh, the complex, as we call it, across all these laboratories, how is it that we can expand the commercial impact of our investments in those R&D activities? Well, that's why the Office of Technology Transitions was uh, started up uh, just about three or four years ago. It is a startup, and we are primarily engaging with stakeholders. We're identifying practices that can be streamlined and policies so that we can engage more robustly with partners on the outside, whether they be private or or public partners. Um, and then we're sharing best practices among the labs wherever we can find them and elevating the visibility, much like we are doing currently with uh, you right now. We have the next slide, please. Um, well, this, this has to do with much of what I was just saying. We want to identify barriers that are um, preventing engagement or uh, causing some friction um, either in time or in the way in which industry can engage with our labs and um, by doing that uh, we want to facilitate the engagement in order to make sure that we can transfer the technologies uh, whether they be technologies that are ready for commercialization or just the expertise to support uh, your own technologies and that the transition of that into uh, practical application we have the next slide please um, some of the activities that we've engaged in so far in our few years of uh, being around, uh, we've helped the labs by um, giving them a cadre of, of terms and conditions that they uh, can substitute um, in their cooperative research and development agreements, the CRADA. 
Um, we're helping them out to figure out what is the best way to develop final reports at the conclusion of a CRADA and understand exactly what should go in there and when it should be submitted so that they're in compliance um, with the law, but more importantly than that, so that the public can benefit from each of these investments that are made in each CRADA, because yes, it's a two-way agreement between a lab and this create a partner but because the federal government is uh, providing some investment in that we should make sure that taxpayers receive some benefit so the results of those CRADA projects ought to be made public as quickly as possible and as um, completely as reasonable um, likewise equity on um, uh, um, licenses that are negotiated we're helping labs um, with that as well as in general uh, with their practices for licensing and this new tool called Agreements for Technology Commercialization of the ACT which provides a very flexible way uh, for a, a partner to come in and work with a lab that's not constrained to the terms and conditions of a CRADA or what we call a strategic partnership project or an SPP. Um, this is really not involving the Department of Energy whatsoever. Uh, an outside entity engages with the operator of the laboratory, which is in itself a private entity. Those contractors that operate the labs and an outside partner can then work just like industry would, right, and have um, industry-friendly terms in those agreements so that they can get moving at the speed of business. May I have the next slide, please? Um, uh, next, well, these are the kinds of reasons why one would engage in an ACT. Why wouldn't you want a CRADA or an SPP? And I'm not trying to be disparaging on CRADAs and SPPs. We negotiate tens of thousands of them. But sometimes um, they can be difficult for some partners if they, for example, cannot uh, provide advance payments or they're not able to agree with the indemnification or they need a performance guarantee uh, as opposed to a best effort. Um, and the ACT is a terrific route. May I have the next slide, please? And the next. Thank you. I want to get moving so that you can get on with your other speakers. The Technology Commercialization Fund is one that is um, uh, managed out of the Office of Technology Transitions. It's got a budget that is a percentage of the applied energy programs across the entire department. And it's going toward uh, commercializing or actually advancing doesn't have to actually hit the market but you're maturing technologies that have been developed at the labs um, and uh, that is on its fourth uh, cycle right now and we're learning from those first three and we're uh, we're probably going to be reimagining the way that we execute on that in the fifth cycle next slide please this is where you can um, take note and grab your notebook and your pen and write down that URL is at the bottom left-hand side of the screen, uh, HTTPS, it's a secure site, slash, slash, search.labpartnery.org. This is um, your portal to the entire DOE complex where you can identify an expert that might be able to help you with a specific technical problem that you're encountering in your building. Um, let's say that you can't quite achieve some goal that you have set for yourself and you don't know where the source of the problem is. You, can, you need an expert. Well, it's tough to find that research that might be exactly pertinent to your problem. So we have a cadre of experts that are available um, through this portal. And then, of course, it has uh, a very deep um, uh, directory, if you will, of all of our technologies that are eachly searched uh, that are available for licensing, if that's the way that you want to go, um, in addition to a, a beta version for how you can access our facilities. Now, the next slide, please. This is basically it in a, in a nutshell, where you can connect with an expert, identify licensable intellectual property, and um, find uh, patents visually to, as we call them, the gems that are the DOE laboratories. May I have the next slide, please? Energy i -Corps is a, a is a training tool that we have uh, been uh, cycling through 10 times throughout the laboratories that train the researchers on the bench 
to engage more um, with their industry counterparts in a way that uh, their industry counterpart can then um, inform the research that's going on inside the lab and uh, enable the researcher to understand what industry needs are. This is a way to make sure that we can be more forward-leaning in our R&D portfolio and um, increase the, the, the stakes for the commercialization prospects of any of our technologies that, are, um, uh, that can be adopted by industry. Can I have the next slide, please? And that's my contact information. Um, I'm sorry that I won't be able to stay for the duration, but Eli will definitely uh, be able to field your questions. And thank you very much for your attention. So thank you so much, Clara. I greatly appreciate it. I know that she uh, uh, has to jump off because she was willing to give up her time to be late to a meeting that she uh, has to participate in. Uh, by all means, as you have questions, I know we, uh, we gave a lot of information in a short amount of time there. Uh, feel free to ask me. I can field some of the questions, and I'm happy to connect you with Clara for any, any follow-up on any of the resources that she has. Um, so with that, I want to turn it over to uh, Patrick Blanchard from Ford Motor Company. Um, Patrick is the technical leader for lightweight materials at Ford Research and Advanced Engineering. Uh, he completed his graduate studies and PhD in mechanical engineering at the U University of Nottingham in the United Kingdom. Uh, since joining Ford in 1999, he's focused on the development of materials and manufacturing technologies uh, for vehicle mass reduction. This has included an emphasis on both polymer composites and magnesium die casting. Uh, from 1999 to 2005, Mr. Blanchard uh, supported Aston Martin during the transition to a more composites intensive vehicle platform, uh, launching initially on the Vanquish, uh, followed by the, uh, the DB9 and the V8 uh, Vantage. Since 2009, he's led a, an R&D team tasked with the concept design and development of Class A uh, and structural composite components uh, destined for a wide variety of Ford and Lincoln vehicle programs. Uh, Patrick, so uh, thank you so much, and uh, we're really excited to uh, to have you here. Well, thank you, Eli, and uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, yeah, it's a pleasure to uh, give an overview of a project that's been ongoing for a few years uh, between Ford Motor Company and Dow Chemical, and uh, this is uh, through the latest phase being executed through a new manufacturing institute that was set up uh, 2015, I think if I'm correct, uh, called the Institute for Advanced Composites Manufacturing Innovation, also known as IACME. So this is uh, an advanced manufacturing office uh, funded institute that's uh, been, say, stood up in the last few years. Um, so yeah, if we go to the next slide. Um, yes, yeah, so, so affectionately known as Project 3.2. Um, so I'm speaking on behalf of the uh, 3.2 team today. I'll give an overview of the main focus as well as on carbon fiber composites development for high volume automotive applications. So next slide, please. Uh, so primary motivator for the program, uh, which was kicked off between Ford and Dow, was um, all about fuel economy. You know, as a whole, the industry has been making great strides. Uh, uh, however, there's, what's hidden behind here is you know, some of the weight saving initiatives which have been performed. So if we go to the next slide. Um, key to the uh, ability to have sustained uh, year over year improvements in fuel economy is our ability to offset uh, you know, new content which goes on vehicles. Uh, the footprint of our vehicles is is forever increasing as well. So, you know, it's it's a question of being able to sort of add all these uh, functionality and, and then offset that uh, through uh, various light weighting initiatives. And so that's where essentially weight saving in general becomes, you know, one of the, the key strategies in order to meet our long-term goals. So next slide, please. Mm -hmm. Um, so as I mentioned, the uh, the work was performed collaboratively with some other um, industry partners. We have Dow Chemical, Dow Axo, which is a JV between Dow and, an, and another company. Um, we we first started discussions back in 2012, uh, but this led to, uh, in 2015, or actually slightly prior to that, uh, to um, a proposal which was embedded in this new institute. Uh, which was a $270 million proposal through uh, Department of Energy. Um, so that was successful and then stood up and then says part of the uh, 
uh, initiative uh, this for DAO program uh, was kicked off as you know as one of the marquee programs so next slide now Eli was talking about leveraging uh, various institutes so IACME is, is, is just that it's uh, an embodiment of uh, a number of different national labs and also academic institutes uh, across the country so from a four perspective you know, we're able to essentially access a very wide network of uh, expertise ranging from all types of disciplines um, and it's um, you know it's it's mainly uh, for us obviously an interest from automotive but it covers other aspects such as wind and oil and gas as well so if we go to the next slide so it's not just the you know the 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 core part, uh, partners within IACME it's also the membership um, you can see from the pie chart uh, there's over 160 members um, they range everything from new startups you know you know doing high risk uh, early um, phase technology development you know all the way through to you know your more standard OEMs such as Ford um, but so yes it gives us a, a huge breadth of uh, um, exposure and particularly at the members meetings you know we have several hundred attend at a time and you know it gives great opportunity to uh, seek new opportunities for technology development and uh, do projects as the one that you're seeing here today so next slide um, so yes so for Dow uh, Dow AXA we came together we identified some core uh, disciplines that we were we needed further support from through the IACME uh, so we have um, Michigan State which which we have this surf prototype production facility surf is scale up um, a research facility so able to do full size component equivalent to a a, a, a regular production you know, for production facility uh, so full size parts uh, Purdue was brought on board to assist with uh, a lot of the simulation activities uh, to you know, further develop uh, the analytical tools. Uh, University of Tennessee Knoxville uh, for a lot of uh, the characterization. Michigan State again for a lot of surface analysis type work and then Oak Ridge. Clearly they have uh, a lot of expertise in carbon fiber material development. Um, okay, so we go to the next slide. So the project was all about um, uh, taking aerospace uh, scale technologies and materials and rethinking that and coming up with a, a new embodiment which allowed us to uh, produce uh, high volume uh, components or support high volume production programs that we were looking to be able to produce of a single tour 100,000 parts per year uh, and then taking that all the way through to a, a final full scale demonstrator project the next slide please uh, we had a pretty good um, uh, target uh, listing for what the material, so this carbon fiber material uh, was needing to be. Our, our competitor per se was some of the light metals such as aluminum and magnesium, uh, specifically die castings as well. So we sort of established a set of material parameters that we needed to achieve in order to be able to sort of compete head on with these uh, other light metal solutions. So next slide. So with the support of, I mentioned the SURF, or they say IACME Cork Town, uh, so this is the pre-preg uh, machine you see in the, on the, on the right-hand side of the screen, uh, so able to produce uh, large quantities of material. On the left-hand side, you've got the carbon fiber and then the building blocks uh, for the chemistry, and this was really sort of developed by Dow. Um, so uh, in conjunction with some of the academic partners. So that was all essentially the material side of things. Uh, but the next few slides I'm going to walk you through is more from the forward end is the application uh, validation and prove out. So next slide, please. So from a forward perspective, again, we're mostly interested in, um, you know, can we scale these materials, you know, put it onto vehicles, uh, validate it against the, the, the whole list of uh, different types of load cases and environments and sort of service loads that we see. So we selected um, a Lincoln MKS uh, and also the Declid assembly for that vehicle because it had previously had a composite Declid uh, on an earlier production model. 
So we redesigned the deck lid inner panel, which you see in green, uh, to be a carbon fiber uh, variant, and then used, uh, I would say, more of a conventional glass fiber outer panel bonded to that. So next slide. Um, actually, we can probably go to the next one as well. Yes, so in order to go through the development program, um, I'm probably not doing justice the amount of work that was uh, performed, but we would go through some standard low case, such as torsion, corner stiffness. We've got all these different uh, stiffness and strength attributes that are, uh, first of all, analyzed in CAE uh, with the expected material properties. And we're able to achieve all our requirements. And you can see it's going to the carbon fiber where we're overachieving uh, by a significant amount over the production baseline, you know, in the, in the order of, um, you know, 55% improvement in, 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 in some cases. So easily passing, and in, in fact, there's probably uh, still significant opportunity for optimization. Uh, so next slide, please. Um, for, but from the weight saving, going back to the earlier slides, you know, we're mostly interested in you know, what the carbon fiber was offering us over production. From standard uh, to the carbon fiber, you know, through one iteration, we're able to take 30% out in weight, and through another iteration of 35. And again, we think because we're still overachieving so much, we could take even more, probably closer to 45% out with a bit more effort. Uh, but so from an analytical standpoint, we're able to validate this, uh, at least give us projections on, on the mass reduction. Uh, next slide, please. So beyond the CAE, we went through a full uh, test program. You can see some of the materials on the left. Uh, on the on the right, with some of those you can be aware, you can just about make out a deck lid. This is essentially a manufacturing schematic of how we produce the part. But we were able to use production tooling again in in the larger manufacturing facilities in order to produce, say, full scale components. So we go to the next slide. This is a, a build up of uh, some of the deck lid inners. So you can see the production in the top right of uh, carbon fiber SMC uh, inner panel, and then going through the various stages of the process as they get painted or and primed. So next slide. So we would then build this up uh, through using the standard production process. So inner panel, outer panel, plus some other hardware for things like the attachment of hinges to give us completed assemblies. Um, so next slide. And then we went through a full testing program, uh, you know, again, to verify or correlate the CAE versus the experimental results. And you can see uh, either static fixtures or actually on vehicle uh, depending on which type of testing we were able to, uh, we were we were doing at the time. So next slide. Uh, so final uh, uh, summary of the testing was that we were able to achieve all the requirements uh, without any issues, and we even went through and did a FS, FNVSS 301 rear crash test, which is 55 mile an hour, passing that as well. Uh, so very successful in in being able to say make all the parts to the validation through our ACME and then also meeting our Ford internal test program as well. So with that, I'll just have one more slide, I think. Um, yeah, I just want to again acknowledge um, the various partners. And again, if the audience is, is, is not yet uh, reaching out to the various institutes through AMO or other parts of DOE, and from a full perspective, that gives us you know, direct access to you know, a, a number of the, the key facilities that are unique in the US and, and obviously a, a lot of the, the fundamental research which supports our vehicle programs. Um, so with that, I'll wrap up and I think we're taking questions uh, at a later time. Thanks so much, Patrick. Uh, that's great. And uh, I know that folks have been uh, sending their questions in. Please just keep typing them into the chat box. And uh, after this next presentation, we'll, uh, we'll take questions for all, uh, for all three panelists. Um, so uh, next, I'm excited to uh, introduce uh, Stan Patrash, uh, Dr. Stan Patrash, um, to talk uh, from Henkel Corporation. Uh, Stan uh, received his uh, PhD in polymer science from the University of Akron in 1988. Uh, throughout his 20-year career in industrial R&D, his focus was on developing advanced characteriz character characterization techniques 
uh, to study industrial, industrially relevant materials and processes at micro and nano scale. His work played an important role in the development of several new technologies and products for industrial adhesives, metal polymer coatings, and electronics applications. Uh, Stan's main expertise uh, lies in the areas of optical X-ray and electron microscopy, uh, X-ray scattering, diffraction, and uh, spectroscopy. Uh, Stan's a leader uh, of the Advanced Characterization Group, which has a specific focus on 3D printing and printed electronic applications. As a member of Henkel's Open Innovation Group, Stan is also responsible for uh, creation and management of collaborative partnerships uh, with academic and government scientific, uh, governmental scientific institutions. Uh, Stan currently holds positions of a visiting researcher at Princeton University, uh, adjunct assistant professor at SUNY Stony Brook, uh, technologist in residence at Brookhaven National Lab, and is a member of the User Executive Committee for NL NSLS2, the, synch uh, the synchrotron light source, uh, which I know he he's going to touch on today as well. So, uh, Stan, I greatly appreciate you uh, taking the time to be with us today, and I, I know I'm excited to hear your presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Eli. So, uh, if you can uh, flip to the next slide, please. Uh, so, I would uh, like to cover a bit the uh, Department of Energy EERE Technologies in Residence program that uh, was actually uh, is co-managed by the Eli from TS office of EERE and share with you the experiences that we had uh, of working with within this program for about uh, two years. Uh, first, a little bit about our company. We, we're not as well known as uh, Ford Motor Company. Please, next slide. Uh, but uh, many uh, many of you will probably heard of it, uh, or if you watch Super Bowl, uh, you probably see our commercials. Uh, so uh, I will tell you a little bit about Henkel. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, uh, Henkel is the world's largest uh, uh, pro producer uh, and manufacturer of adhesives. Uh, we're not very well known as an adhesive manufacturing company, but you heard about the uh, adhesive called Loctite, which is actually, it's a Henkel adhesive. But initially we started uh, 140 years ago, we started as a laundry detergent company. Uh, we actually invented the, not we, but uh, our predecessors, our co-founders uh, uh, co have invented laundry detergent. Uh, and then, uh, in addition to laundry detergent, they also find out that they need an adhesive to package the laundry detergent to ship around uh, around the uh, Europe. So they have to invent a better adhesives. And as a result of that, uh, about 60% of the company is actually focused on the adhesives applications, as well as on the, as, uh, uh, in addition to the 40% on the laundry. You probably have seen the laundry commercial during the Super Bowl uh, for the Persil. Uh, it, I think it was a 30, 30, minute, uh, 30 second spot, but uh, we're not uh, going to be talking about adhesives, to, uh, about the loaded detergents today, we're going to be talking about the adhesives. And adhesives you will see in pretty much every major area from uh, industrial applications to electronics to consumers and craftsmen. Uh, you will see our adhesives in packaging of cereal boxes and uh, juices. You will see adhesives in transport and metal applications, both in automotive. Uh, uh, I think the regular uh, regular car has about 30 kilograms worth of uh, Henkel adhesives in it, as well as in the aerospace, where we'll provide the adhesives in carbon fiber composites uh, for customers such as Boeing and Airbus. We provide electronics adhesives and, and materials. Uh, if you have iPhone or Android phone, you will probably have about a dozen of Henkel uh, materials inside this uh, inside uh, the smartphone. We provide the adhesives for general industry as well as under the brand Loctite we provide for consumers and craftsmen. The challenge for us as a company, as you can see, we have a dramatic range of different applications. Each of them require particular properties such as strength, uh, conductivity, thermal conductivity, th thermal insulation capability, uh, non-toxicity, uh, barrier properties, all of those requires a lot of fundamental research that has to be done to find out how the material properties can improve the functionality of our adhesives. What we realized quite a while ago that we need to move away from traditional Edisonian approach of doing work where we basically formulate the adhesive, then, uh, uh, then uh, uh, tweak the formulation a bit, test this, the end performance, uh, and then try to, by formulating, by basically changing the initial, para initial formulating parameters of the adhesive to get to the final performance. What we needed to really understand is how the materials perform in our 
uh, in industrial applications in order to create the best performing materials from the fundamental principles. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, the challenge for, for that is literally bridging the gap. Sometimes, sometimes it's called valley of death or uh, uh, death zone is the gap between the fund fundamental knowledge about the materials, which is usually concentrated in the universities where uh, they focus on the early discoveries and this, they focus on the solutions with, uh, of, uh, with a, a lot of fundamental complexity, but a relatively smaller te technical complexity. On the other hand, uh, we have the industry which uh, is which understand very well the market needs uh, has very good expertise on the end use but generally lack uh, a bit fundamental knowledge about the materials so in the middle there is this green hump that has to be always bridged when we need to take our material from the fundamental knowledge to the industrial applications so this is something that uh, our group of, uh, of adhesives research and particularly my group of advanced characterization this Every time we develop the, the material, we have to bridge the gap between the fundamental knowledge and the industrial applications. Uh, next slide. As it happens, this is also the major function of national lab. National lab are ideally suited to, to bridge the gap between the fundamental discovery and the market needs. The national labs, they are indeed the crown jewel of the uh, of the american society they are ideally suited for this multi-complexity multidisciplinary, long time horizon ch challenges that span fundamentals of the applied uh from the fundamental r d to the applied r d what is so basically the, the 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 slide that i showed you about the necessity of bridging the gap between the between the fundamental science and the industrial science this is actually was uh, borrowed from the doe office of science presentation from may 2016. so we were very happy and very uh, excited to find out that the, the mission of uh, of researchers in the industry and the mission of researcher in the national labs literally coincide so uh, we, it was a natural point for us to start partnering with the National Lab to bridge the gap and work on the same function together. Next slide, please. As already mentioned before, the U.S. Department of Energy has over 17, uh, it has 17 uh, labs. But to, to put a bit of a numbers on it, the budget of this uh, Department of uh, Energy Office of Science is over five billion dollars, and just in 2016, and o o almost one billion dollar is spent is just in user facilities operating budgets. This is basically to to help users such as academic and industrial institution to take advantage of the capabilities that exist at the national lab perhaps most importantly the mission and the research target of the department of energy as well as the industry almost always coincide they focus on nanomaterials they focus on the biomaterials and they focus on self assembling materials that can help uh, ad advance and uh, address the next challenges in the technological applications. They focus on the renewable energy applications, such as advanced tr transportation or energy generation, advanced electronics, optics, and particularly what we're interested in is 3D printing. Most importantly for me as a member of the advanced characterization group is the methods of characterization. Unlike, unlike universities, the, department, the, uh, the government labs, the Department of Energy labs, they focus on in situ, in operando, in vitro method, method of characterizations, and they also take advantage of the big data. Many of these labs have multi uh, decades of expertise in computer modeling and simulations, and they really bring those capabilities to bear in addressing up these technologies. Next slide, please relatively recent programs that helps to bridge the gap of knowledge and understanding between the national labs and the industry was technologist in residence program and very briefly this program identifies the individuals in the labs and individuals in the industry and basically pairs up those individuals as a as a almost as a couple as a, a couple of technologists in residence who can then uh, in their respective institution identify the need from the industrial spend the standpoint and identify the capability from the Department of Energy standpoint you really uh, and really connect those needs in order to solve the technological problems. Uh, so uh, I've been technologist in residence at Brookhaven National Lab for uh, almost two years now with my partner uh, here, uh, Pat Looney, uh, and we were extremely successful in pairing up uh, in identifying those capabilities and pairing them with the needs of the, of the industry. So next slide, please. 
So we started our journey uh, as, as uh, our TIR journey, technologies and residence journey by identifying Brookhaven National Lab as a strategic partner. We had previous connection to, the, to this lab because they housed this, the National Synchrotron Light Source, uh, a very powerful X-ray source that we will use for, uh, we used previously for our material, material studies. But then uh, this source was closed and they built a brand new one, the latest, the greatest, the best facility in the world uh, for generating X-rays to characterize uh, to characterize and study the behavior of the of the materials. Perhaps also almost as importantly, uh, the Brookhaven National Labs in the, lies in close proximity uh, to uh, two major Henkel R&D centers uh, located in New Jersey and Connecticut. Uh, the Brookhaven La National Lab, of course, is located in Long Island, New York. So we started uh, our our work with uh, basically participating in this in the um, in the uh, qualification experiments at the NSLS-2 second generation X-ray facility, as well as running some proprietary project with, uh, uh, with Center for Functional Nan Nanomaterials, also located at uh, Brookhaven National Lab. I, I can't tell about uh, much about that, but uh, the, uh, the quantum dots that was mentioned in the in two, uh, in previous presentation, that was our project. It was focused on the quantum dot. Uh, uh, experimentations. We then expanded the scope of our projects beyond just one particular beamline. Beamline is the experimental lab which uh, which uses uh, a, a one specific technique, uh, uh, X-ray technique to study the material. So we're currently using five different X-ray techniques to study our materials. And just to testify to the effectiveness of the uh, of this program. Uh, the presentation the, that I'm delivering right now, I'm actually right now locating inside the Brookhaven National Lab, inside the National Synchrotron Light Source, getting ready to conduct yet another experiment to study our, uh, our materials. And, and our uh, collaboration with them also resulted, uh, resulted in me being elected as a user executive committee representing not only the industrial, but all users of, uh, of the Brookhaven National Lab to help uh, current and potential users such as you to explore uh, more uh, capabilities of this fantastic network of, uh, of national labs in, in the United States. Next slide, please. So uh, beyond the Brookhaven National Lab, we use the connections of the technologists and residents to identify uh, uh, other graphs. Uh, there is a typo here. Typo here. It's not EERE. -E, it's the NREL, National Renewable Energy Lab in uh, in uh, Colorado, where uh, I, I think one year ago there was a, a held council of technologists, uh, which I think many of you in the smart uh, in the building management community would find absolutely fascinating. The NREL lab in Colorado, they actually focus on energy efficiency of the building materials and the electrical grid and many many of these labs there they literally have a mock-ups of the apartment uh, apartment or uh, individual houses where they identify how the construction of indig individual house or a apartment or an electrical system in there can be used to better save energy in running those uh, those houses so, so for something that for the for the building managers for the uh, for the uh, for the developers this is the NREL uh, lab would be a fantastic resource there we were interested in their capabilities of studying the uh, thermal materials for the uh, automotive uh, electric applications we also currently have contact with Lawrence Livermore National Labs and St. Dia Labs in the area of additive manufacturing we actually submitted two joint laboratory directed R&D proposals with Lawrence Livermore National Lab. Uh, unfortunately, they weren't funded, but uh, we don't give up. Uh, at some point, we will get funded and we will also work with the Lawrence Livermore National Lab. And we also collaborated with the uh, Oak Ridge National Lab to take advantage of the fantastic Additive Manufacturing Center. Uh, next slide, please. So currently, we're strengthening our ties with the Brookhaven National Lab. Literally today, uh, we onboarded uh, our, our, our postdoctoral fellow who's 50-50 funded, 50% uh, by Henkel and 50% by uh, National Lab to work in the, uh, uh, with us uh, in the area of additive manufacturing. And we're currently building instrumentation to study the uh, 3D printing additive manufacturing uh, processes and materials for them in, in operando, meaning uh, as the materials being printed, not before, not after, but during exact, exact 
uh, uh, industrial processes. Uh, as a future plans, we're developing, pl we're developing capabilities for uh, joint government industry academia center for additive manufacturing located in Brookhaven National Park. And we're exploring, uh, we're exploring potential to actually uh, create a Henkel run implant lab where Henkel scientists would be, uh, would, be, uh, would be working inside the Brookhaven National Lab uh, within the so-called Discovery Park, the set of offices and, and lab facilities that are being planned to build here in order to further enhance the collaboration between the industry and, acad and academia and, uh, and national labs. So uh, next slide, please. So in summary, uh, DOE and national labs are fantastic resources for industrial partners. They are indeed crowd jewels of, uh, of United States scientific community. And uh, they are not only uh, they not only excellent in the technical terms, but they're also te excellent in the collaboration terms. The people here are ready and willing to collaborate with the external partners. And the TIR, which we've been participating in, is an excellent step to get to know the capabilities of the DOE. Uh, what we really would like to see from the DOE side is a bit more diverse ways of interactions between them. Currently, CRADA is one of the few mechanisms, but sometimes for other smaller companies, uh, it might not be the best way to go forward. Uh, so we're looking to explore these capabilities, and we're also looking, there is currently, uh, we're also looking into the creation of the uh, DOE nonprofit organization. There is currently uh, a bipartisan legislation moving in Congress, uh, to create this non-profit organization similar to the NSF non-profit that would allow easier, uh, easier, pro easier ways to collaborate between the uh, industry and, uh, and government, um, government labs. So uh, I'd like to thank you for your attention. Uh, I, I really try to fit into the uh, time allotted and would be happy to answer uh, all, your, all of your questions. Wonderful. Uh, thanks so much, Stan. That, that, that was great. You, uh, you shared a lot of uh, really good information there. Um, so let's go ahead and take some uh, questions from the audience. Oh, as the slides, I guess going back for a second to point out, uh, the, we have the, the website for labpartnering.org, which is more information about the lab partnering service. And then by all means, should you Google the Office of Technology Transitions or the Technologists in Residence Program or uh, IACME, the, uh, the Manufacturing USA Institute, um, we're, we're happy to provide more information on any of those resources as well. Um, so as we get started with questions, I just uh, I want to mention as well that uh, as, Stan was, uh, as Stan was mentioning, uh, it is a priority here at the Department of Energy to facilitate access uh, to the incredible resources at our national labs. Um, so to that nature, by all means, as they share my, my contact information at the end of the webinar, um, fe feel free to reach out if there's something that you're interested in at the National Renewable Energy Lab, at Oak Ridge National Lab, at any of the 17 national labs. Uh, we're happy to facilitate a visit. Um, on that note as well, the Better Plants program uh, is hosting and we've extended an invitation to all of our better buildings uh, uh, compadres, um, uh, what we call Technology Days, which is a two-day event uh, to showcase the resources of the National Lab, allow people to network and make connections with the National Lab scientists to uh, to learn about how uh, the re you know to learn about how to partner with the National Lab. Uh, so these are held at a National Lab. Uh, what we're particularly excited about this year um, is that this will be held. Uh, uh, April 9th and 10th uh, in the Bay Area, and we're featuring not one but two national labs. Uh, Lawrence Livermore National Lab will host our partners for a day, and Lawrence Berkeley National Lab will host our partners for the following day. So if that's something that you're interested in, April 9th and 10th, uh, please reach out, and we're happy to get you more information uh, about that event. So with that, I'll turn it over to some questions. Um, Patrick, uh, you know, if my, com if my company was thinking about joining one of these institutes, uh, what would you say are the key advantages and disadvantages of uh, of participating, you know, doing research like this, uh, you know, through an institute? So I, I think the key one for Ford is acceleration to market. Um, you know, the accessing of the resources just allows us to move faster. So if we can move faster, that that's great. Uh, and then secondly, that there are some, you know, through, through IACME and in particular this institute and, and, and Oak Ridge in general, there are some uh, unique facilities which just are not available elsewhere. So that allow us to perform our research, not only at lab scale, but also at uh, you know, a, a full production scale. So these are, I think, two key items which draw us into, uh, into the institute. 
That's great. Uh, thanks. Thank you, Patrick. Uh, Stan, one of the things that uh, uh, someone noted, or and I certainly liked hearing about, was you know how much you leverage the TIR partnership, uh, not only to you know develop this uh, you know great dynamic long uh, long term relationship with Brookhaven National Lab, but also to explore the capabilities across the National Lab enterprise. Um, you know, how did you go about identifying, you know, uh, you know, what Livermore, Lawrence Livermore National Lab had to offer or, you know, why you should be talking to some of the other labs? And then, you know, how did you identify who to talk to at that lab? Well, the, 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 this is this is actually this, the, 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 the probably the biggest uh, strength of the TII program, because for the outsider, the uh, this, uh, the structure of the uh, of the Department of Energy National Lab could be a bit overwhelming. These are big labs. These are labs that uh, were offshoot of, of the Manhattan, uh, the original Manhattan projects. So for people who have specific questions and specific topics to be addressed, just basically going to one of the scientists and trying to talk to them might be uh, might be a bit overwhelming. So what we were able to do through the TIR program, remember TIR uh, partners the. Uh, the contact from the industry with the specific rel quite high level scientist uh, and, and or manager at, at, uh, at the national lab. What, the, what this manager at the national lab can they do, they can basically go directly to the upper management of the relevant national lab and say, hey, my partner is interested in, in topic A. Who are you, who are in your department or any of the other department are the key personnel working on this uh, on this topic? So it basically goes uh, instead of the sort of bottom up, it goes up to the bottom. So they basically they can immediately identify the correct person, the correct contact, and it also helps sort of uh, with. Uh, with a bit of a sort of management incentive attached, because when the scientist is who's working on this program, he has he's, he has contact from the uh, from basically the director of his division and saying, hey, here is the here is the guy uh, uh, coming from, from the company, and by the way, this is coming sort of from the from the management. So could you please pay? Uh, sort of uh, pay them a little bit more attention. This is extremely helpful. So it really cuts down through a lot of uh, sort of calling and trying to identify the right person and maybe uh, trying to figure out the right resource. It basically goes right straight to the point. It goes through the uh, the point of contact of people direct, who are directly in charge of this particular program. So uh, it was both, it happened at the Lawrence Livermore National Lab, it happened at the Oak Ridge National Lab. You get immediately put in touch with the right individuals working on the research that you would be in interested in. Uh, th thank you, Stan. Uh, that, that's, a, that's a strong endorsement. Um, Patrick, a related question that, that you got, um, you know, how did you go about identifying the partners that you worked with on the project? You know, had you had, had, you had relationships with them before the start of the project? Uh, so, yes, in, in some part, um, we have existing projects and we have a university uh, Alliance network, which we, which has been stood up for, for many years, and we have ongoing activities there. But I think through uh, the institute and also working with uh, their, you know, their governing body, uh, their IACME HQ, if you want to call it, um, they were also able to recommend some other partners that uh, had, you know, key infrastructure or capabilities that could support the project. Uh, so yeah, they opened up doors, to, you know, which we hadn't really contemplated before. And sort of made of made us aware of technologies which you know have complemented some of the other activities we we already had ongoing. So uh, it's been a bit of a mix. So uh, a yes, existing relationships, but b it's definitely opened up uh, new parts of communication. Wonderful. Uh, thank thank you, Patrick. Uh, Stan. Uh, how difficult was it to form uh, to navigate forming relationships and developing projects and proposals uh, at all the you know at the different national labs who uh, oftentimes uh, have their own ways of doing business? Uh, not difficult at all. Uh, what we found is uh, that uh, scientists here are extremely talented individual and extreme what uh, they are uh, the extremely problem solved, uh, for, uh, the extremely focused on solved problems. So 
uh, what they also what I found them because they're scientists they're also extremely curious so if you bring them an interesting scientific program which in industry we basically were full of the interesting scientific and technological problem they get excited they get interested they said I never thought that you guys in the industry working on such challenging such scientifically important topics and uh, it it was I I don't know maybe 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 it just happened uh, I, I lucked out on uh, interest uh, on uh, uh, on good people but everybody was nothing but extremely helpful in in uh, in solving our issues as I said if you if you manage to sort of to uh, strike up the curiosity the scientific uh, curiosity in the scientist you ba then basically all the work is done they would they would do a lot of work for you they would uh, they would explore the capabilities as as, as Patrick said that uh, uh, you we haven't even probably contemplated before so uh, both at the Oak Ridge, Oak Ridge National Lab Lawrence Livermore and uh, and specifically at Brookhaven never had any problems with lack of interest lack of enthusiasm uh, uh, extremely helpful uh, dramatic contrast from for example interacting with the academia where sometimes as I said uh, Academia is uh, it's a little bit of conflict of interest. They're interested in publishing papers. They're interested in educating people. But industry and, and, and national labs, they're interested in the same thing. They're interested in commercially, uh, commercializing the technology. And this is, I think, the key point there. Uh, thank you. That, uh, that's really helpful, uh, Dan. So a question, uh, it was a question that was posed to Patrick, but uh, I'll, I'll open it to both of you. and. Uh, with that, I know after this question, I think we'll we'll probably wrap up. Um, you know, for both of you, the the title of this panel was you know lessons from the field, real world applications that inform R and D. Uh, so the question that uh, we we got was you know Patrick, how often does Ford's research team look to folks on the factory floor for feedback uh, about opportunities for innovation or to save energy? You know, how often are you hearing from folks? Who are you know who are manufacturing every day about the challenges they're facing or you know areas uh, you know areas where they think uh, you know if we uh, if we dedicated some time and money to research and development that it that it could have a it could have a big impact. Um, so I, I would say that under typical circumstances, our projects you know reach out way beyond our, our research um, you know facility into the plants because you know ultimately these folks are responsible for execution and, and delivery on our vehicle programs. Um, so I, I think over the years, and it does take time, you know, there's a, you build up a very strong relationship all the way down the pipeline. Uh, and so after, you know, one or two instances, that becomes a bit of a two-way street. Um, so it, takes, it is all about, you know, networking and people, but uh, I'd like to think that we we do receive, you know, you know, constant feedback from our plants, regardless of the types of projects and the types of things we could be doing better, as well as obviously, um, you know, coming up with our own uh, ideas as well. So it's it's a constant quest, and I think nothing's perfect, but it's it's, it's definitely something which features in all our programs. Perfect. Uh, wonderful. Thanks, Patrick. Stan, anything to add from uh, from your perspective? Uh, very similar. It's nice to know that uh, big companies separate very similarly. Uh, Patrick mentioned the word pipeline, uh, and that's exactly what we have uh, uh, at Henkel. Uh, we, we recently, uh, several years ago, we instituted a uh, rather formal, uh, uh, it's called ADP, Adhesive Technology uh, Development Program, where we have actually two processes happening at the same time. We have technology development going on in the, in the more uh, research-oriented se uh, centers, and then the product development going on in the more production uh, and uh, and plant uh, plant oriented centers and those two processes they literally form a pipeline a technology when technology is being developed it has to have a pipeline into the uh, into the product as well as when the product needs to be developed it it requests it it, uh, it creates a request for the sort of technology to support this product uh, to, to be developed and we also have a, a formal structure of individuals who actually oversee this pipeline and to make sure that uh, the processes there happens relatively i mean uh, as, as said not perfect but relatively smoothly and efficiently so it's it's a, it's 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 a specific structure that was created to align the needs of the of the plants and the and the product development people with the technology development and uh, sort of future directions in which technology is moving. So uh, 
um, it is it is it is not only uh, sort of nice to have; it's an absolute requirement to have people uh, in the plants and product development being aligned with the uh, with the technology development uh, organizations. Wonderful. Uh, thank thank you both uh, so so much. Uh, re really informative answers. I know I, I benefited a lot from this. Um, so with that, I think I'm going to uh, wrap up. Uh, we hope, uh, we hope you enjoyed the remainder of the Better Buildings webinar series where we're taking on uh, the most pressing topics facing energy professionals uh, with new experts leading the conversation on uh, proven best practices, cost-effective strategies, and innovative new ways to approach sustainability and energy performance. Um, uh, I believe next slide. Um, but, uh, so, uh, additionally, we hope you'll plan to attend the next Better Buildings webinar on Tuesday, March 5th from 3 to 4 p.m. titled Better Buildings, Better Bodies, uh, Strategies for Health and Wellness. Um, meet uh, Better Buildings partners who are implementing uh, design strategies and benchmarks in their uh, buildings and sustainability plans that focus on the wellness, health, and productivity of the people inside them. Uh, speakers will highlight the FitWell certifications, Well Standard, and, uh, and more. Uh, lastly, and next slide, um, uh, so that was, yeah, sorry about that. Uh, registration is open for the uh, Better Buildings, Better Plants Summit, which will take place on July 10th and 11th in Arlington, Virginia, in the DC metro area. Uh, Pre-conference activities will take place on July 9th. I know for us that includes a lot of exciting tour opportunities, tours and training opportunities. Uh, to find out more information and to browse the agenda, uh, visit the Better Building Solutions Center linked in this slide. Uh, we hope to see you all there. Um, with that, uh, I guess next slide for the close. Uh, with that, I want here's all of our contact information. Um, I'd like to thank our panelists very, very much uh, for taking the time to be with us today. Um, feel free to contact our presenters directly with additional questions or if we weren't able to get to your question during the Q&A period. Uh, if you'd like to learn more about Better Plants, the Better Buildings Challenge, or Alliance, uh, please check out our website or uh, feel free to contact uh, my colleague, Kendall Samuelson, uh, directly at the email or, you know, feel free to contact uh, myself. Uh, I hope you'll uh, follow the Better Buildings Initiative on Twitter for all the latest. Uh, you will receive an email notice when the archive of this session is available online. Uh, thank you, everyone. I hope you got as much out of this as I did. Uh, I uh, look forward to the next webinar. Um, and with that, uh, that wraps up this webinar.